Inner View with your host, Charles Subin. We're just kind of sitting around here with a man that you probably would recognize even if he didn't have all the furs and the diamonds because maybe it's the smile that makes it. I don't know. But as you see, it's Liberace. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We, now we I had to try out the piano. That's right. We didn't ask him to play, but I wanted you to know, and folks, I don't know if you know, but I want you to know that this Baldwin Grand Piano was donated to Channel 10 by the Liberace Foundation, Las Vegas, 1980. How's that for... <laughs> uh, entertainers are forever being called on to do things and uh, forever being asked to give this and that. Uh, we don't but a lot of entertainers ignore it and hide from it. But uh, you have a reputation of uh, being generous in that way. Why? Well, I, uh, I feel privileged that they ask me, first of all. And uh, I can't do everything that they want me to do because there's a lot of benefits. And I think they uh, sometimes have benefits for th diseases they haven't discovered yet. But... Uh, uh, I do try to spread it out so that I can do uh, my part uh, the best way I know, and that is to uh, sort of conserve myself and just do the really uh, important and needy ones. I always do the cerebral palsy one, and, and uh, I get a lot of requests for uh, uh, articles that they can auction off you know, at uh, fundraising things. And uh, sometimes they get a, a, an amazing price for some of these things. I, I remember one incident where they, uh, they were having some kind of a tennis tournament for charity. And uh, I did a gag tennis tournament with Bobby Riggs one time. And in order to uh, make it funny, I had a tennis outfit all uh, jeweled and sequined, and I, I only wore it that one time. <laughs> so there it was, and I thought, well, this is a perfect thing to donate, and they got $10,000 for it yeah. because I wore it. You know? That's amazing. But uh, I love doing things like that, and of course the museum is uh, uh, probably the best way I know of for uh, funding uh, universities. There's seven of them now that we give scholarship funds to through the uh, museum uh, and the Liberace Foundation. Hmm. I also saw that you walked into a L.A. florist not so long ago. They were doing some uh, arrangements, and it caught your fancy, and all of a sudden you put your own name on it for special designs. Have I got that right? Yes. Uh, they're going to put out a Liberace collection of uh, glamorous uh, floral arrangements that people can put in their homes, and they're all named after uh, musical compositions like Claire de Lune and Moonlight Sonata and Concerto and Rhapsody. And uh, they're silk flowers that are uh, 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 glamorized with uh, rhinestones and, and uh, sparkle. And uh, it seems to fit the modern uh, decor of a lot of people's homes. Well, the museum is something, and uh, it just so happens as if you didn't know here. We yeah. George came in. Hi, George. Good to see you. Good Fine. to see you. I'm very happy to be here in the audience and listening yes. to my brother here. That's <laughs> close, really. <laughs> tell us about, well, first of all, tell us about this, because I asked George would he bring over a candelabra, and, and sure enough, uh, you, tell us about this one. Well, that's, uh, can you hear me all right without yeah. mic? Excuse okay. me, yes. We brought this from the museum. It's one of the highlights of all the people that come in because it's one of the first candelabras. 1947 is the date on it and it's quite heavy. You know, I grabbed it and it took both yes. hands and, and a lot doing to bring it over here. And uh, one of the boys said, one of the candles is a little crooked. I said, don't try to straighten it out. It might fall apart. <laughs> so that's it from Liberace Museum. Why? Why the candelabra? Well, I saw a movie about 1945 called Song to Remember in which uh, 
uh, Chopin was portrayed by Cornell Wilde. And in one scene in the movie, uh, uh, Merle Oberon carries in a candelabra and places it on Chopin's piano. And uh, it was uh, uh, one of the highlights of the movie. I remember it uh, being so beautiful. And uh, here was this great composer sitting in this darkened room. And when she walked in with the candelabra, suddenly everything lit up and his music uh, seemed to sparkle more and everything. So I thought, say, that's a great gimmick. So the next day, I went out looking for a candelabra. And I found one on Third Avenue in New York in an antique shop. And uh, it had real candles. It wasn't electrified. And uh, I opened at the Persian Room uh, in New York at the Plaza Hotel. And uh, uh, just before I made my entrance, they darkened the room. And then I didn't have Merle Oberon, but I had a, <laughs> an attendant. Uh, come in and place the candelabra on the piano and suddenly the audience who had been chatting and talking and suddenly became very hush-hush and very quiet and attentive and I began my show and I found it was a great attention getter and almost overnight it became uh, a trademark because uh, the press in New York picked up on it some of them spelled my name wrong, but they said he's the piano player with the candelabra. And, and suddenly uh, I found that people were imitating me, you know, uh, comedians and all that. And the easiest person in the world to imitate because all they had to do is walk out with a candelabra and sit at a piano and everybody knew it was me. But what a wonderful thing yeah. to be imitated. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, your name. Jeff Sullivan. And you sing in? In uh, Jubilee at the MGM. Right. Now, yeah. singers, you know and I know, singers, no matter how good they are, become a dime a dozen. Uh, you know, in the marketplace. Piano players with a smile become a dime a dozen in the marketplace. So the old adage is, you got to have a gimmick. And uh, right. this, does that seem to you like the key? I, you, are you talking about sure. me? Um, I don't know. I, I must thank Liberace because I think he's probably responsible for my going into show business. When I was a kid growing up, I used to watch your half-hour television show. Uh, I grew up in Tennessee and I think it came on at about 10 in the morning there or something. And you always look so happy and I, that's what I wanted to do. And so as I got a little older, my mother gave me piano lessons and I went from there into the singing and so forth. So oh, that's a real I wound up in Las Vegas, but I thank you very much. Oh, great. <laughs> You've been in show business for, this is your 36th year? Professional year. Actually, yeah. I've been in music uh, almost all of my life, since I was four. Now, in that time, you have uh, officially introduced and helped people. But are you uh, unaware of all the people like Jeff who have been influenced? How, how do you find that out, except incidences like this? Well, sometimes uh, people write me letters telling me about uh, the influence my uh, programs had on their lives or something. Or uh, When I meet them in person at one of my shows, they'll come up to me and tell me uh, stories like uh, Jeff just told. And then there's a lot of people that I uh, never really get to talk to that are in hospitals and things. And it's quite uh, amazing to know the far-reaching effect of uh, television in that respect. There's a lot of people uh, uh, who can't get out, you know, to see shows that uh, you can influence their lives without really knowing it, just by appearing on TV. Mm. I think television is very important for that reason, but I, I think my favorite kind of entertaining is uh, playing to a live audience in person, you know. That's, to me, the purest form of show business. Was that television show live then? Well, I did it in front of an audience, but it was filmed. It was filmed. Uh, in the beginning, it was a local show, which was live, and then we went in syndication, 
after a year. And uh, uh, the program eventually was seen in about 350 or more markets, which is more than a network show. And that's why in every city it was on at a different time. Some cities it was on at night sometimes, or during the day or the afternoon or the morning. But it was on somewhere all the time. <laughs> when you were doing it, do you ever uh, think about making a mistake while you're playing? Well, no. I, I used to think play that with was one of the I was small, and I would be terrified <laughs> to make a mistake. I think it was one of the charms of early TV because. Uh, we did uh, the show uh, very uh, impromptu-like. We didn't rehearse a great deal. I would get together with the director and, and with my brother George, and we'd talk over the music, and uh, we just did it, you know? And uh, we didn't uh, worry about if I perspired. I perspired, I took a handkerchief, and I wiped my brow, but now, uh, it's so polished and it's so perfect. Everything has to be so, you know, rehearsed and everything that sometimes I think it loses its spontaneity. And that was one of the things about early TV. It was natural and real. And in fact, uh, uh, I always felt the camera was a person because I never thought of millions or thousands watching. I just thought of a group of people sitting in their living room watching the show, and I treated it uh, in a very intimate way. And if I bumped into the camera, I would say, "Excuse me," you know. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you happen to see the uh, Academy Awards recently? Yes. Oh, then, what was your impression of Liberace on the Academy Awards? Oh, by the way, your name? Sherry Langley. Hi. I enjoyed it. I'm what What is it that uh, it was that larger than life uh, image up there? And you were playing all the, uh, the nominated songs? Nominated scores, actually, yeah. musical scores. Well, it was kind of funny because, you know, like I always have a candelabra, and when they set the, uh, during the dress rehearsal, they set the stage, and I came up out of the floor, and I, I looked at, and there was no candelabra on the piano, and I looked at one of these uh, set designers, and I said, you forgot my candelabra. You know, it's part of my trademark. I really should have it. He said, wait, wait. They came <laughs> in with four giant candelabras that were about 15 feet tall. And he said, will these be all right? It's this huge candelabras. They took them out of some mansion. They borrowed them for the show. And I said, I want them, I want them, <laughs> but I didn't get them. <laughs> in terms of actual performance, give us an idea of the difference between what you were describing in the, the early television series and what just happened on the Academy Awards, in terms of atmosphere, in terms of what's expected of you as a performer. Well, it's, uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no room for error uh, in a show like the Academy Awards because it is live. And it is, uh, uh, you can't afford to make any mistakes. So uh, I remember uh, in the dress rehearsal, one of the dancers uh, in the uh, uh, James Bond number, uh, uh, Only For Your Eyes Only, with uh, Sheena Easton, he slipped on the stairs. And he was the main character. He was playing James Bond. He slipped on one of the stairs and uh, hurt his knee. And so during the dress rehearsal, uh, he'd been rehearsing this for two weeks, and it was a big opportunity for him. And then during the dress rehearsal, he limped slightly. And they took him out and replaced him with an understudy. So those things are kind of sad when they happen. So you're kind of keyed up. You have to. Uh, uh, you're under pressure because you know you only got to get one chance, and it better be good. And uh, early television was more relaxed. I mean, if you made a mistake, you it made you human, you know. And uh, uh, I would split infinitives or something like that, you know, my Milwaukee English, and uh, people thought it was charming. You know, I wasn't letter perfect.
But uh, nowadays, if you make a grammatical error, they'll stop the film and they said, you used a double negative, or you said this or that, and let's do it again, you know. And uh, I liked early TV because I remember one time I was doing Kitten on the Keys, and I said to the director, who is such a friend as well as a director, I said, Duke, Duke Goldson his name, I said, wouldn't it be fun if we could have a cat or a kitten walking across the keys? He said, well, wait a minute. He sent somebody out in the alley, and they got an alley cat. <laughs> and next thing I knew, I had a cat on the keys walking all over, and they superimposed it. And people remembered that. And another time I did uh, uh, a number called How Deep is the Ocean? Now, uh, that immediately uh, calls for some giant, fabulous underwater set, you know, that could cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So Duke says, has anybody got an aquarium? And so bring it to the show. They brought their aquarium. They shot through the aquarium, and I was playing the piano uh, <laughs> through the aquarium, and it looked just like a million-dollar stage set. But you know? weren't going glub, glub, glub. <laughs> <laughs> I, can that fun ever be back again on television? Has it gone forever? Well, I think uh, there's a few shows that still have that spontaneity. I think that's one reason uh, Johnny Carson is so popular, because things happen on his show that uh, are uh, very spontaneous, and uh, you have the feeling you're watching it live, even though it may be on a delayed broadcast. But uh, I'd like to see that type of thing come back more. I think that's one reason our newscasts are so popular, because they are, you know, for the moment. And uh, uh, we are now seeing things that we weren't able to see in early TV, like uh, historical moments in, uh, when Reagan went to visit the Pope. I mean, they immediately had that on television, which is unbelievable that they can do it so immediately. You know? Well, when we come back, we're going to ask you some things about uh, how your career got off the ground. Oh, we'll okay. be right back. <laughs>